My name is Jordan. Uh, I'm sure that most of you, or all of us, at some point have watched um, television. You know, it's one of those things we kind of grew up with. And a lot of these days, a lot of um, shows are labeled as children's shows, but are, they should not be considered, considered as children's shows. So tonight, I want to argue that watching television negatively affects children. And I want to go through this by first going through my first two points, which go through children's shows, and uh, my last point, which is going to go over watching television in general. So my first point is that children's shows negatively affect their learning process. So my secondary point for this would be that um, the shows impede their learning process. The University of Virginia psych uh, psychologist tested four-year-old children immediately after they had watched nine minutes of the popular show, SpongeBob SquarePants, and found that their executive function, the ability to pay attention, solve problems, and moderate behavior, had been severely compromised when compared to four-year-olds who had either watched nine minutes of Caillou, a slower-paced, realistic public television show, or had spent, or had spent nine minutes drawing. So, an example of that also is um, my brother. He, when he was young, he used to watch, watch a lot of SpongeBob, even to the point where he imitates SpongeBob's laugh, which is kind of not obnoxious, but it's what he likes. And I noticed that, like in third or fourth grade, he was a little bit behind in his in his reading. And around that time is also when I found out that it is kind of attributed to his watching SpongeBob because that's also what I found online at the time. And actually, this, this um, fact from the University of uh, Virginia mentioned Caillou, which I will go over later, which I found there's two versions of Caillou, one where he complains a lot, and one where he actually follows and listens to what his parents say. So my secondary point for this is also, um, the shows prioritize entertainment over education. It is possible that the fast pacing uh, where characters are constantly in motion from one thing to the next, an extreme fantasy, where the characters do things that make no sense in the real world, it may disrupt the child's ability to concentrate immediately afterward, um, says the psychologist from Virginia. Another po possibility is that the children identify with focus and frenetic characters and then adopt their characteristics, kind of like how my brother did um, with SpongeBob. Even though he can't drive, and in one of the one of the um, episodes, he was taking his, his driver's test and he drove blindfolded, which is kind of I don't know if you want to put that in a children's show. So my second main point is that the shows reinforce negative habits. I'm sure we've all heard, heard of Sesame Street, and in Sesame Street there are characters like the Cookie Monster and Oscar the Grouch. So the Cookie Monster is obsessed with cookies and, and whenever he sees it, he goes crazy. Isn't it kind of, isn't that kind of like enforcing gloomy? And then you have also the Grouch, who in the children's show lives in a trash can and that kind of tells kids that it's okay to do that. And the reason for that is that children, they learn by listening and watching. Secondary point for this would be that um, some children experience violent outbursts as a result of watching things like Power Rangers. I myself used to watch Power Rangers when I was younger, and the reason my mom took all the, the videotapes away was because like, after I would watch it, I would start like, punching and kicking around, and then she didn't like that, so she gave them all away. I was, I was pretty mad, but oh well. And um, in one study investigating the short-term effects of media violence, Elementary school children exposed to one episode of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers demonstrated significantly more, seven times, intentional acts of aggression, such as hitting, kicking, and shoving that did a group that did not watch the program. This was taken from um, an article, I believe, by uh, Princeton. Also, a longitudinal study examining the long-term effects of exposure to violence found that heavy exposure to television violence predicted increased, increased physical aggression in adulthood. Even after researchers controlled for the child's initial level of aggressiveness, the child's IQ, the parent's education, the parent's TV habits, the parent's aggression, and the socioeconomic status of the family. 
So we, as you can see, the violence in television really affects children. My third main point I want to go to is that it neg negatively affects their health. So the first point for this is that watching the shows causes an addiction. I actually have a baby cousin that um, would, she's like two years old, but she's constantly on YouTube. And whatever you take it away from her, she always um, cries or she gets mad about it. On average, children's, children ages two to five spend, spend 32 hours a week in front of a TV, watching television, DVDs, DVR, and videos, and using a game console. Kids ages six to 11 spend about 20 hours a week in front of the TV. The vast majority of the view, of viewing, 97% is of live television. And this is from the University of Michigan. So as you can see, it's not only ch children's shows that um, negatively affect children. And even for children's shows, there's a lot of violence as opposed to adult television where you have things like Tom and Jerry. It's, there's a lot of violence in it. Because of these reasons, I feel like television has a negative impact on children. All right, the propositions clearly identified. The phrasing, I think, is a little bit broad, but I understand ultimately what you're focusing on. Although putting uh, the television programs that you have in the same category, I think, is a little problematic. You drop in SpongeBob, I don't know this other show, Caillou, uh, the um, Sesame Street, Power Rangers, stuff on YouTube. Uh, I'm not sure that you are identifying something that is as consistently... Uh, distinct as it might be. You know, the only thing that's in common is that you know, they're directed towards a young age group, but when it comes to your proof, it's a little bit inconsistent. For instance, on the Sesame Street stuff, all you've got is hypothetical arguments about what it might, you know, doesn't it teach, you know, I mean, you ask it as a question, doesn't it teach that doing this is okay or that that's all right? without offering any proof on it. I thought you were a little bit better on a couple of the other points. Uh, the Power Ranger example, for instance, with the study that marked the uh, increase in aggressive actions, I thought that that worked a little bit better. And it might have been a good idea to maybe just focus on one particular negative harm, like um, you know, aggressiveness or like uh, passive behavior or like a lack of activity on the part of kids. There's so many general statements that you're making that don't get uh, as much support as they might need to. I'm not exactly sure why we should be worried if a kid gets uh, spoiled and uh, cries because something is taken away from them. That's true about just about any toy that a kid gets if they've misbehaved or overused it or something like that. I'm not sure that there's a harm in that. You need to kind of demonstrate those things. I can kind of tell what you're doing when you use all the personal examples to, you're trying to make it interesting and uh, also explain the subject as you're going on, but because there's so many of them, it sounds like you're trying to argue on the basis of personal experience, and I don't think that that's nearly as convincing as it needs to be, so maybe one or two of those personal things to introduce a concept, and then a little bit more of uh, substantive research to support those particular points. I thought you got uh, out of the speech in a pretty effective way with your exit line, that's fine. Could have used a little bit better summary. At the beginning, you had a preview. It sounded like you had two secondary claims. In the body of the speech, it sounds like you've got three secondary claims. In the beginning, the secondary claims in the preview were not really stated as, prop not as, stated as claims. They're just topic areas. But when you did get to the body of the speech, you are presenting them as claims. I think you want to be consistent in those two situations, too. All right. Thank you.